Morning, everybody. Welcome to Veritas. My name is John Turbot, and it's hard to believe, but uh, just 30 days ago, my wife Missy and I and Isaac Hayes were standing in Ukraine, and we were part of a group of about 140 people that were gathered together from all over the world, and we came to a city in Ukraine called Mykolaiv, and then every morning for about a week, we were sent out in teams of 12 into the outskirts into these villages that had been battered and beaten by the war and by Russian troop occupation. And it was during that week in early June that we got to meet and we worked alongside uh, a guy named Joe Newcomb, and we got to hear his story. This is, this is Joe. And he is now uh, a 62-year-old guy. He was born and raised in Philly, and drug and alcohol overtook him in his teen and young adult years, and he quickly became a slave to his addiction, and he told us, I never glamorized the details of my old life. It was an ugly past from 16 to 38. Drugs, alcohol, and everything that goes with that. And he was eventually arrested and convicted and sent to prison for a couple years. And after being there for a while, he told us he started to attend a Bible study. But he quickly told us with a smile, he only went to the Bible study to get out of his cell for an hour. And he's like, that's what we all did, man. We just, we would go to Bible study. That was what he meant for that hour, but God meant it for good. His life was changed as he listened, and he started to read the Bible that he'd been given, and God spoke powerfully and personally to Joe, and he became a Christian. Of that point in his life, he would say, I was 38. I was sick and tired of living the way I was living. I never knew there was another way, and I was delivered by the blood of Jesus Christ. He served a year and a half in prison, and then he got paroled out to a Christian rehabilitation program. And he spent a year in that program reading the Bible, memorizing scripture, and then he stayed on with them as an intern and then a staff member. And then at some point in that, a Christian mentor asked Joe this question. This is what he told me. Somebody looked at him and said, Hey, Joe, what's it going to look like when you now obediently live out your faith? Joe said all he knew was construction at that point in his life, and he wanted to be obedient to God. So when an opportunity arose to be on a disaster relief team, he took it. So he went with a team to Canada when it was hit with a, with a tsunami, and he planned on staying for 30 days, and he said he ended up staying for nine months, helping families clean their houses and their wells. And from there, he went on to Indonesia when it was hit by a historic tsunami, and then it was New Orleans when Hurricane Katrina came about. All the while, he said he was just preaching the good news of what Jesus had done in his life. Joe's words are, with every swing of the hammer and every scoop of the shovel, man, that's what I was doing. And he is now well acquainted with a life of addiction, and he has kept a foot in the addiction recovery process. And he said to Missy and I, he said, you know, it's customary in those groups, and you guys have heard this, to introduce yourself like this. Hey, I'm Joe, and I'm an alcoholic. And he said, I never do that. And I'm like, what do you say, Joe? And he says, I say, I'm Joe. I'm a child of God, delivered by the blood of Jesus. And I thank him and let people know every day of my life. So Joe has been texting me now since Ukraine periodically, always super encouraging texts of, of thanks for my faith, his faith, everyone's faith, and what the Lord is doing. When I spoke to him last week, he said he's going to be returning to Ukraine soon to build five houses. Then he's going on to Romania to build two more. And he said, Lord willing, he would be in Turkey in August to build uh, more houses there. And then he hopes to go to Indonesia, where he's headed into a prison to help with a ministry, the exact same organization that helped lead him to Christ 25 years ago. Amazing. So this is not a call for you to chase tsunamis today, or natural disasters, or wars all over the world, or to, to build houses even, or to work with people that are recovering from addiction. That's the story that God wrote for Joe in Jesus. But the question Joe was asked by his mentor 25 years ago might just be the right question for us this morning. What would obediently living out your faith look like? 
And I wish I could get Joe to stop being so darn obedient and come and to Dubuque for like maybe for a couple days and worship with us. And I put the offer out there because I would love you guys to all experience that kind of God-induced thankfulness. It just, it just rolls off of this guy and how humble and flexible he is with his whole life. So 30 days becomes nine months becomes a lifetime. And the excitement that he brings to every conversation. So I thought maybe Missy and I caught him at just the right time on the steps of our hotel when he rolled out his testimony and shared that. And then like 10 minutes later, he's doing the same thing with the next person and the next person. And as I was around him, I was just motivated to go for it and ask myself, hey, John, man, what's your life going to look like when that same God takes your faith and ignites it and sustains it with that kind of obedience. What's that look like? So as you open your Bibles up to Romans chapter 1, you might recall from last week that Paul called this something. He called it the obedience of faith in verse 5. Or you might say today, the obedience that comes with faith, or the obedience that faith is the, the source of. So as Travis pointed out in the middle of verse 5, as you're kind of finding your your way and looking back there, Paul's purpose in life was not just to bring people to faith, but to bring people to have the obedience of faith. So you see those words tucked in the middle of verse 5, right? The obedience of faith. And then he says, he did it, he gives you the reason, for the sake of his, that's God's name. See that right there? Translation, Paul dreamt about. He got up and he was motivated by. He brought all of the best stuff in his life to see as many people as possible not only have faith in Jesus, but he tried to stir up and help create a faith that led to an obedience. And he says in verse 5, when Christians have a faith that's marked by obedience, whenever and wherever that is happening, God is wonderfully and, and beautifully and miraculously put on display. So if you didn't know it, Romans is a letter about the gospel. It's written by a guy, Paul, whose whole life was about this, this gospel bringing uh, him and, and him to saving faith and working this out in his life. And so the gospel, or the good news of Jesus, man, it gives us something, church. It gives us this, this faith, this treasure of faith. And from that faith, Christ followers like, like Paul or like my buddy Joe naturally have something take place in their souls. It's, it's unstoppable, and it's, it's undeniable, and it starts to show itself more and more and more in daily life. And Veritas, we could be part of this same faith. This could be us. So today in verses 8 through 15, we're going to see a big idea take shape, I think, and I think it's going to be this. We see God clearly when faith overflows into everyday obedience. So we might say that, that God is glorified or people see him rightly or they see him for actually who he really is when faith starts to lead to obedience daily and in the most practical ways. So Veritas, this obedience of faith Paul is going to start describing and give us a taste for today, it changes things in your life. Like, let me give you a few examples you're going to see and then we're going to read this together. It changes what you're thankful for. It also starts to inform and shape where you go and where you stay. And number three, it starts to change who your obligations in life are to. So would you guys stand up with me? Let's read this. I know everybody just got settled in, but let's stand up and read Romans 1, 8 through 15 together and see if you start to see this, this faith and this obedience of faith and what it looks like maybe daily taking shape. Here we go. Romans 1, 8 through 15. First, I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because of the news of your faith that's being reported in all the world. God is my witness whom I serve with my spirit in telling the good news about his son that I constantly mention you, always asking in my prayers that if it's somehow in God's will, I will now at, la at last succeed in getting to come to you. For I want very much to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you, that is to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. Now, I don't want you to be unaware, brothers and sisters, that I often planned to come to you, but was prevented until now, in order that I might have a fruitful ministry among you, 
just as I've had among the rest of the Gentiles. I'm obligated both to the Greeks and barbarians, both to the wise and the foolish. So I am eager to preach the gospel to you also in Rome. This is God's word. Have a seat. Now, best we can tell, Paul had been traveling and preaching the good news of of Jesus for almost 20 years when he wrote the letter that you now hold in your hands called Romans. Acts chapter 20, if you go there, like in the first five verses, it helps us timeline this in history to somewhere around like 55 AD. And to let me help you place this in your own mind, this would be a little less than 2,000 years ago. And at this point, Jesus would have uh, been crucified uh, and rose from the dead about 25 years or so before this is all taking shape. Paul was not in Rome, even though this is called Romans. He's writing a letter to Rome. He wasn't there when their church started. He didn't even have a direct hand in their church getting planted. And yet, you see in those first eight verses, right, the guy really wanted to get there. But with or without Paul's presence, God was building up this church in Rome. And it was pretty diverse. A little bit later in the passage, you're going to see where Paul refers to Christians in Rome as Gentiles. And history tells us there were actually some Jewish men and women that had been converted to Christianity that were mixed in with the Gentiles there. But the Christian Jews had been kicked out of Rome by the emperor Claudius just a little bit before this letter got written. Now, some of them were starting to trickle back into the city and make their way into the church. And so things were sometimes a little tense at that point. There was ethnic differences and some cultural differences, and they were trying to figure out who's going to lead the church and what's going on. So their church was not without some bumps and some rough edges that the Lord was was working on. I was told by someone it might be helpful if we actually read this letter today And imagine this group of mostly Gentile believers, but with with some Jewish Christians now joining back into the church. Picture them meeting in a cramped apartment somewhere in a poor suburb of Rome, and this was being read out loud as they sat in that apartment. Now, we're a long ways from the end of the letter, but if you would choose, you could look ahead to chapter 16, and it makes it really clear. This was not a letter written to, like, seminary graduate Christians. This wasn't going to scholars. Paul wrote this letter to the ordinary, everyday Christian who had their lives changed by the gospel, and now they were just trying to live it out in obedience in faith. These were the people that God used to start the church, and spread the gospel in Rome back then. And this letter should give you you and I a lot of great encouragement because it's actually for plain Jane, everyday, ordinary Christians like you and me, saved by grace, by putting our faith in Jesus. And guys, God is clearly and beautifully seen in our lives when our simple faith starts to follow him in everyday obedience. So let's look. Look at verse 8, and I want you to see three examples today of how this obedience of faith looks like in the life of Paul. And then we'll try and make some connects to you and I and our church here in Dubuque. And I want you to see these as a beautiful picture of what God can, through Jesus, do and will do in your life. This is not, an, this is not the whole picture of what the obedience of faith would look like. Think of this as like three little pictures we get here today kind of quickly. Number one. The obedience that comes with faith in Jesus made Paul thankful. Guys, don't run past this, because I think we do a lot. We're like, oh yeah, Paul was thankful, I'm thankful, we're all thankful. Let's not run by that. Stop and look with me at what Paul is thankful for. Do you see it there in verse 8? He is thankful to God for them. I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you. That's an earnest and a really heartfelt thanks to God for people. So it might sound something like this. Jerry, I thank God for you. Or Tacey, man, this morning, I'm just thanking God for you. Or Dylan, I thank God for you. Or Mary, I thank God for you. So faith is a treasure, guys, but it only exists in, in people, right? Not apart from people. People have faith, and people obey God out of faith, right? Okay, so how crazy is it that, that faith grows in a certain kind of person and in a certain kind of heart. 
And when God has worked in your heart to produce that kind of faith, and that, that heart can start to see that faith in other people, it naturally leads to joy and thanks. That's, that's what happens. So notice, Paul thanking people, thanking God for people in Rome, was because, do you see why he's actually doing that? He says it's because of the news, of their faith being circulated. So there was some kind of buzz. People were talking And the word had made its way like 50 miles from Rome over to Corinth, which is where Paul was at. It's like 52 miles away or something. And when it says in all the world, everybody in all the world was saying this, that's what your grammar teacher back in high school would have called hyperbole. It would be more like somebody saying like, dude, it's crazy. Everybody's talking about the faith at Veritas Dubuque. Or guys, we've heard all about you in Rome. Clear over here in Corinth. It's amazing. So not necessarily every single human being in the world, just, man, there's a lot of talk of this. Now, i got to point out the obvious thing here um, that occurred to me when I'm reading this. Paul could not have heard about the faith of these Christians if it was not tangibly or noticeably or, or perceptibly doing something in their lives and in the lives of others and, and in the city of Rome. It's because their faith actually produced the fruit of obedience that everybody had something to talk about. There, there would be no news back to Corinth if everybody just had this private faith that wasn't actually showing itself. The reports received by Paul, and they had to be about something, right? So Paul will write later in his letter, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, and believe that in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Some of you might be familiar with with that verse in Romans. So in one very important sense, faith is undetectable. It's it's a matter of the heart. So I can't see it, right? That's true. But we're just a few verses into this letter, and Paul tells us that it is this obedience of faith that he lives for, that he lives to see in everybody's life. So in a very important sense also, guys, man, faith has to be detectable, right? It has to have an overflowing and an outworking in in your life and in our church. Somehow, faith shows itself such that Paul picks up his pen and says, man, I thank God that he has given you the kind of faith that is doing real things in the world over in Rome. This past winter, we studied James. Some of you might remember that. And he wrote, show me your faith without works, and I will show you my faith by my works. So James went on to say that belief in God and his son was good, but that's not the same thing as faith. He said, man, even the demons believe. You might remember that. And God does not give us faith in the resurrected Jesus without following that with some kind of, apparently Paul's saying, newsworthy. Some kind of faith that starts to generate reports about obedience. Paul and James, man, they're saying the same thing. And lastly, this joy, this thanks is not directed at the person. This is really important. Um, I hadn't caught this. It's really got my, my mind and my heart this week. Do you guys see that? Romans 1.8 does not read, man, I just want to thank you, Roman Christians, for what I'm hearing about your faith, does it? That's not what it says. Look at that verse. Because that almost sounds good to my ear. Like if I was to say, Dylan, I want to thank you for your faith. We'd be like, oh, that's nice, John. That's a nice text. But that's not what Paul says. Look at the difference. It might seem unimportant. But he says, I thank my God, for you because of your faith. So the thanks has to be directed to the root cause or the source. The one who's ultimately responsible for faith and obedience. Paul has heard the news of their faith because God was the initiator and the grower and the, and the facilitator. And so guys, can we just say there is no faith and there is no obedience of faith apart from God. So Paul, man, he just rightly thanks God for their faith. Okay, so I was thinking about this. This might be helpful. So say after church today, before everybody gets up, I'm like, hey guys, sit down for a second. I have some amazing news. I was actually part of a, uh, a major motion picture, a movie. And, and right on cue, the tech guys dim the lights and, and a clip of the movie comes up that I'm talking about. But they have to play it like five times because it's a very, very short clip. It's only like two seconds, right? And, and the clip gets done rolling and I'm like, Hey guys, isn't that amazing that Hollywood made a movie about me and gave me the star role? And, and at this time, you guys are all 
scratching your heads. You look really confused. And I'm getting frustrated that you don't understand how I am, you know, the star of this. And so I asked the tech guys, I'm like, guys, can you please pause right in the middle of that clip for me? And they pause it at just the perfect time in this little two-second clip, and I get a laser pointer, and the screen has like hundreds or thousands of actors all over, and I point to a fuzzy little dot up in the left corner. And I'm like, guys, see? That's me. It's about me. And at that point, some really blunt salt student, man, praise the Lord, raises his hand and says, uh, bro, I don't think that movie's about you. And I'm like, oh, he's so right. He's so right. Because only by some writer and producer and director's grace did I find my way into this bigger story. The dot on the perfectly paused moment in just that second is only ever meant to somehow tell something about the, the bigger story and point everyone to the actual leading character. And can I connect this back to the truth that Travis helped us see last week? Paul said clearly in verse 5, if you look back this, all of this is for the sake of his. That's God's name. So Paul's life, my life, your life, it has a glorious point, doesn't it? And it's not about us. We thank God for people, and specifically because they have become believers and then live in obedience because of God. That's why we thank him. So let's check that. Paul's going to say the same thing if you jot this down and look later. In Romans 6, 17, here's what he says. But thank God, because although you used to be slaves of sin, you then obeyed from the heart, and you were set free from sin. Man, be amazed, Christian, right? Like, if you're a Christian, I just want you to laugh this morning at the ridiculousness of God choosing to save you from the bondage of your sin and giving you this gift of of faith in Christ. Isn't he good? And in Ephesians 2, 8, 9, Paul will say, for you are saved by grace through faith, and this is not from yourself. It is God's gift, not from works so that no one can boast. So you and the Christians in your life become who you are, not because of you and your efforts, not because of them and their efforts. We can't boast that we even woke up this morning, guys, and are still Christians. We can't boast that over the the toughness of the last couple months that we have remained in our faith. You and I got free from our bondage of sin and we've actually stayed in the faith of Christ because of God. So we thank him for each other's faith. So coming to the the point of this, this first thing, love faith, man, love people. Love when people have faith and let your heart and your affections and your 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 uh, excitements be stirred when people come to faith and be thankful when people have a faith that actually endures through suffering and persecution and under all of this be like Paul when he says I thank God for you when I see him performing the miracle of faith in your life okay so verse 8 man it starts painting this picture of the obedience of faith in your life and my life and in the life of our church And I would leave you with this, coming off of this first point, which is the obedience of faith changes everything we're thankful for. So what if the text message you sent this afternoon or you received from somebody this afternoon read like this? Hey man, it was so great to see you in church this morning. I was thanking God for you. The steady faith I've seen in you these past few weeks has been a huge help and encouragement to me. What would that text look like? How would that hit you? So guys, we want God's name to be set apart and made much of in Dubuque when we as a group of Christians see him as the giver and then we actually give him the glory for doing the giving. All right, let's move on. Look at verses 9 through 13 with me. Jesus says that that faith overflows in obedient living and Paul shows it steers our desires and it gets really practical. It goes down to Man, where we actually go or where we stay. Maybe how we spend the next few minutes in our life. So look with me over 9 through 13. And I'm going to show you that although Paul wasn't in Rome, look at the things that he was saying about his desires for Rome. Here we go. He was constantly bringing up the Christians in Rome in his prayers. Verse 9. He very much wanted to go see them. Verse 10. He wanted to give them a boost of strength. Verse 11. He wanted them to be around so he could encourage them, but also so they could be a big encouragement to him. That's verse 12. And he says in verse 13, he wanted to go do some ministry right in their midst. 
We don't know why Paul actually didn't get to Rome at that point. The best guess we have is in Romans 15, 12. If you look ahead there at some point, he says that, man, my, my evangelistic work, the work I was trying to do in Greece, it just wasn't done yet. But look what Paul says in verse 9. He says, I can't get to you right now, so I already have been serving you. And how does he say it in the middle there? With my spirit in telling the good news of his son. So I'm like, how, Paul? Like, dude, how are you saying that you're, you're serving the people in Rome when you're 50-some miles away? What's that mean? Now, he could be saying that, hey, I'm kind of doing my part over here in Corinth. I'm teaching and preaching and doing what I'm doing. That's true, but it can also be read to say that Paul was actually serving the Christians in Rome and somehow telling them about the good news of Jesus even though they were 50 miles apart. And how would he be doing that? Well, he tells us, keep going. He says, I constantly pray for you. I constantly mention you in my prayers. So Paul is apparently serving Christians who are some distance away. He's actually preaching the gospel to them while they're 50 miles away by constantly praying for them. And he specifically says, hey Lord, man, if it be in your will, I'm just requesting that I could get to them to help strengthen their faith. But why? Why, why does Paul want to get to Rome so bad? I mean, he's got work to do in Corinth. Well, go on in verse 11. He actually tells you why he so badly wants to get to Rome. Here he says, For I want very much to see you so that I may impart to you some spiritual gift to strengthen you. That is to be mutually encouraged by each other's faith, both yours and mine. And in verse 12, if you keep going, Paul says he wants to get them, get to them so that he can do ministry work so their faith might be strengthened and encouraged and be made more fruitful. So what we see is that the way Paul serves God in his spirit, in the gospel, is by praying continually that he'd be able to get to Rome and strengthen their faith, which is what Paul's whole life is about, right? He said it back in verse 5, like, man, I just want people to have obedience of the faith. So what do we learn about Romans and Paul and faithful obedience in these verses? Point two, I think what we see in this is that obedience that comes from faith changes where we go and where we stay. And I might add to that and why we, we go and stay and how to think about the places that we maybe don't get to go. Don't we see all that here? So let me see if I can help you guys think about this practically. Here's some practical applications coming out of, out of this second point. First, where you go to college, where you land for your first job or your second job or what the day-to-day -day life of a retired person looks like through God's eyes, or if you should remain in this place, or maybe transition somewhere else. But you could also apply this actually to your movements in much smaller places and much smaller increments of time, like, hey, what should I do with the 12 minutes I have before church starts out in the lobby? Or what should I do with the 19 minutes I have right when church gets done? Should I always talk to my best buddies, my long-established friends, or the people whose views and interests make this conversation more comfortable? If Paul were with us, would he not encourage us as you read this to follow his example and bring all that stuff before the Lord? If that sounds crazy, I don't think it is. So when you walk into church, here's what you could say. Hey, Lord, man, point me to the right person to hang out with. Or when church, when we start breaking up and going, be like, hey, Lord, man, just get me to the person that, that you want me to, to spend a little time hanging out with. Put that before him. Brothers and sisters, man, let's have a heart posture and a mindset that's, that's more gospel-informed, more God-centered, and more for, focused on what do we see here. It's just really simple, right? What's the best for the faith of other people? Man, are you thinking about that? What a glorious thing we could be thinking about. And what can we do for the sake of God's names? So, what if our prayers were something like this? Hey, Lord, thanks a lot for this period of singleness in my life. Would you just open up my heart and my mind to use this season for the good of the faith of others in my life? Or, hey, Lord, man, I see a couple job opportunities in front of me. Where do you think I'm going to best be able to help other people's faith and make your name look great? Hey, Lord, would you help me with that? Man, it needs work, doesn't it? Like, none of us do this enough, but that's the point today, is not to beat us down, it's to lift us up and say, wow, we could actually start praying those prayers and thinking that way better. So let's not give ourselves a forever pass on this. Let's instead encourage each other as a congregation and say, man, let's move in that direction. Number two, if we are going to stay in a place, maybe for decades or just for a season of life, then let's be mindful to be prayerful of churches and gospel efforts other than the one that we're currently in. 
and for Christians that don't even worship here, say, at Veritas. So man, is it any surprise that the Christian church in Rome was doing so well? Man, Paul says, I pray for you guys all the time, right? So this little church is doing good, and Paul is praying for it all the time. So do you think, guys, Veritas, could we have just a little more space in our hearts when we're getting together for coffee or for hangs and we pray? Would we have just a little more space in our heart to pray for Veritas, Iowa City, Veritas Cedar Rapids, Veritas Urbana, maybe Candeo, maybe Doxa? Or what about the church right here in our own town that's just dwindling, that's actually dwindling down to almost nothing? What would be the impact on that pastor and that congregation if we as a congregation were actually praying for that church. For some perspective, man, I'm occasionally reminded, guys, we are that church. People in Iowa City and Cedar Rapids pray for us almost daily and for our faith. So, man, we don't want to forget to be like Paul and say, man, I'm, I'm actually in Corinth now. I'd love to get to Rome, but maybe I should just be praying for some of these other places. Third, and I want you to look back at, this is still just some thoughts of application. Look back at verse 12 for just a second. Paul makes it clear that his desire as he prays, is not just for them to be strengthened and encouraged their faith in their faith by his faith, but also, he says, so that I can get encouraged by their faith. So my last thought on this would be, hey guys, don't be too quick to think that God has brought you to this time in life or to this living situation or to this job so you can just do so much good for everybody else's faith. Paul, who's actually an apostle, the guy's a legend in the faith, what does he say? He says, man, I actually can't wait to get to you so that you can also encourage my faith. This is how the Lord works. So the more and different people and lives that you get invested in, man, the more that you actually will be blessed and encouraged in your faith. So Paul says, hey, let me motivate you today. Veritas, let's go for it. Let's get involved in more people's lives so that we can be encouraged. And that brings us to point three today in our last couple of verses. Point three is that this obedience of faith that Paul has started to talk about changes who our obligations are actually to in the world. So look at verse 14. Paul does not say he has an obligation to the Jew and the Gentile, but instead to the Greek and the barbarian. That can be maybe a little confusing. The audience of this letter was the church in Rome, as we said, which was largely Gentile. But then Gentiles could kind of be split into, into two groups. The Greeks were kind of the highbrow, kind of the sophisticated, civilized, intellectual people. And then the barbarians, well, that was pretty much everybody else. So Paul's saying, man, I'm obligated to both the high-minded people, right, and to the barbarian, to the Greeks and the non-Greeks, to the wise and the foolish. So pretty much to everyone is what he's saying, no matter their ethnic background or how smart they are. So this obligation that you read in the, in the CSB, if that's where you're looking, or maybe your Bible says debt, it can be translated that way. But Paul's never even been to Rome. He actually hasn't been to this church yet. He certainly doesn't know lots of people throughout Rome, so he doesn't owe anybody money. We're not talking about him owing, you know, cash to anybody. The obligation or debt that he owes to all of Rome is a moral debt. He's burdened by an obligation that came with Jesus having called him as an apostle. And specifically, Jesus called him to take the gospel to Gentiles. So Paul spent the rest of his life after Jesus met him on the road in a flash of light, making good on that obligation. Ultimately, the debt Paul owes is owed to God, and then he owes it to Christ, but he transfers that indebtedness, that obligation to the people who, who need to still hear the gospel. To Paul's way of thinking, so long as he is alive, he can't pay that debt off, right? Because he owes his life to literally every person he meets. Tim Keller, who's a longtime pastor and an author and a great thinker, if you've ever read him or heard him, explained the obligation like this. So here's possibility one, right, with an obligation. First, man, you lend me $100, and I'm in debt to you until I pay you back the $100. That's pretty simple. But Think about a second scenario. Someone else might have given me $100 that I'm supposed to pass on to you. And I'm in debt to you until I actually hand off the $100 that's been given to me. And Paul's like, yeah, mine is like that second obligation. And I'm obligated to everyone, everywhere. God has shared the gospel with me, and I have not cleared my debt until I, until I share that with everybody. So I'll just spend the rest of my life sharing the gospel with everyone. So I'm never going to get tired as 
a pastor here at Veritas here and somebody say, hey, John, I want you to know that I've decided to dedicate the rest of my life to Jesus. Regardless of how many times I hear that, that's always going to hit. That's going to be good. That kind of fire in the hole, in, in, the, in the soul, should be the heartbeat of every believer. And I just got a text recently from someone that told me their next plan in life was to just get a car so they could fill it full of people and get them to church. I think the first thing they said is, hey, I'll get one of those white vans with no windows. And I'm like, that's creepy in 2024, so we won't do that. Just a bigger car would be good. Bring more people to salt and to church. But the fire is right, isn't it? This is exactly what Paul's talking about. He's like, your debt is not clear until you die, Christian, right? God gave this to you to pass along, and the debt's not done until you come home with him. Look again at verse 15. Paul's just reaching down into his soul, and he wants to show you guys the depth of his passion. As much as is in me, man, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome. Every fiber of my being, man, it's, it's, it's ready to preach the gospel to you. I can't wait to get there. So I want to close with just a little bit more of the story between Paul and Rome. Maybe you don't know how this goes. If you didn't know, Paul finally ended up getting to Rome at some point. So he, he told us in here, man, I can't wait to get you. I've been busy with other things. That's great news, isn't it? He, he gets to Rome. But it's funny, isn't it, when we pray out of faith and obedience for what seems like a really godly thing. Have you ever done that? Like, like Paul is like, man, get me to Rome so I can encourage and be encouraged and do all these things. But it's funny how God chooses to work sometimes. So let's, let me tell you how he worked in this situation. Paul actually won himself an all-expense-paid trip to Rome. That's how he got there, complete with travel, food, and lodging. He even got an armed security detail, all paid for by the Roman Empire. And he entered the city as an ambassador. When our hearts are set on a thing and we pray for it, God might grant the blessing like he did for Paul, but it may be in a way that we never looked for right? So what did Paul pray in verse 10? Look at it again. God, I'm going to faithfully and obediently keep praying for the, for the faith of those people in Rome. And man, that it might be your will that I get to go and be with them. That's what he prays. And God loved Paul, and he loved those Christians in Rome, and his answer was, and his will was, yeah, you shall go to Rome, Paul, but you're going to go in handcuffs. So guaranteed, if you guys could have gone over to Corinth when Paul was writing this letter and you could have seen his whiteboard in his study, you would not have seen this listed under his action points, right? It wouldn't have said, get to Rome to encourage faith with a line out from it that says, get government really mad at me and then free trip, right? Like, that was not his, his master plan as he was sketching it up in Corinth. Paul hadn't thought of that plan, but it was still the best way for him to get to Rome, and how else would Paul have found himself standing in front of the emperor of Rome? Not only did God sovereignly orchestrate getting Paul to Rome, man, he did one better, right? Like, he's like, I'll get you there, all expense paid, and you're going to stand in front of the emperor, and you're actually going to tell him about Christ. Veritas, you should expect the obedience that we see here that flows out of your faith will definitely lead you to new obligations and new people. And it's not going to come in the way that you're thinking or praying usually. These are not things that are going to be on your whiteboard or your action points. You're going to wake up one day realizing that God has answered your prayer to go somewhere for him. But he has painted an amazing new picture, and he's going to say something to you like he did to Paul. Like, hey, you're going to go, but you're actually going to go in handcuffs but maybe let's make it a little more realistic. For you, it might be, hey, you actually aren't going to be going. You're going to just be staying. Or you're going to be sharing the gospel with that person that you've been praying for, but it's going to be after I take you through the suffering and I lead you through that. That's when and how you're going to share the gospel with that person. Regardless of how or when or with whom or how God chooses to prepare you or to change the circumstances, Man, I pray, guys, that we would be steadied by passages like this one and that you'd be able to echo Paul. Look what he says in verse 15 through all of this. I'm eager to preach the gospel. Man, would we be eager in our faithfulness and our obedience to, to preach the gospel? So let's do that, Veritas. This is the picture Paul's painting, right? So let's pray together in a moment. I'll lead us out. And here's the things I would love to pray. And what if this became the culture of our church, 
God gets seen when our faith becomes not this private little thing that you hide over here, but when we start to let it overflow into everyday obedience. Let's thank God for each other. We could start there, right? We could start to write text messages and get together, and I could hug you, and I could say, man, I thank God for you and for your faith and the reports of faith. Let's give, let's give ourselves to strengthening each other and each other's faith and ask God, hey, who should I sit with? And how long should I stay here and should I go there, Lord? Man, you just show me where I can strengthen other people's faith and have my faith strengthened. And third, let's encourage each other to have hearts that have an obligation that say, man, we're going to keep preaching the gospel to everybody in our lives until you bring us home, Lord. You make that happen. So as the musicians come up, for those of you who've received this new life in Jesus by placing your faith in him, we want to invite you to join us in celebrating this picture of Christian life. That's what we do. We call this communion, and we do this every week as a group. And as you worship over the next eight or ten minutes, come up out of your seat, and we'd like you to take the bread and take the juice and take those back to your seats. And like Paul said in verse 8, man, I want you to thank God for your faith, for starters, the gift that he gave you through Jesus' death on the cross. Because it was in those moments that Jesus said, man, I'm actually going to take your lack of faith and your disobedience, and I'll put that on myself, and I will pay the price of that so that you can have faith and I can bring you in to obedience. So man, if you know Jesus like that, we pray you just come up during these songs as you're worshiping the Lord, take that back to your seat, remember him, thank him for what he did, thank him for faith, and pray for obedience of that faith in our lives. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, man, we thank you for guys like Paul that wrote letters like this, Lord. We can see his heart just coming through. We see his motivation, Lord. And he wants your name to be made great. Lord, I pray that we would encourage one another this week, maybe even starting this afternoon or this evening with messages and get-togethers where we say, man, Lord, I am thankful for that person because you gave them faith and you share that with them, Lord. And I pray that we would be a people that as we walk through life and we're contemplating Man, the next minutes or the next days or the next months or years, Lord, would you let us be a people like Paul that just says, man, I've got some desires. They seem good, but Lord, what your will is, man, will you work this out? And Lord, we pray that you would do something amazing in those circumstances. So help us to walk together and to encourage one another to lay these things down at your feet, Lord, right down to how we spend even our afternoons and our evenings. And Lord, finally, would you let us be a people that encourage each other to have hearts to share your gospel, Lord, to pay it forward to every person we come in contact with until you bring us home. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.